Hello and welcome to the next lecture. In the last lecture, we started scoping rules in R programming. In this lecture, we will continue talking about these rules. So why exactly does all this matter? It's not immediately clear. So typically the function is defined in the global environment so that uh, values of the free variables are just found in the user's workspace. So this is kind of the right thing to do and uh, is kind of what most people are expecting. If there's uh, you can't find a value inside the function itself, you just look in the global environment. So this is the idea here so that you can define things like global variables that will be common to a lot of different functions that you might be defining in your workspace. The key difference in R is that uh, you can define functions uh, inside of other function. And so for example, a function can return a function as the return value. So in most functions, they will return a list or a vector or a matrix or a data frame or something like that. But it is possible for a function to return another function. And then if that's the case, then the function that's get returned, it was defined inside of another function. So the environment in which it was defined is not the global environment. It's really the insides of this other function. So this is when things uh, get interesting. And this is when the scoping rules really have an impact on what you can do. So I'm going to define a very simple function here. And often these kinds of functions uh, come handy where you might think of constructive functions. So the idea that the function is constructing another function. So here's what I want to create a function that defines another called make.power. And what make.power takes as input is a number n. Okay. So and uh, inside the make.power function, I define another function called pow and pow is going to take an argument called x. And so what's going to happen is that the power function is going to take the argument x and raise to their power n. And so make that power returns with the function power as its return value. And so you see inside the power function x is a function argument, but uh, that's not a problem. But n is a free variable because it's not defined inside the power function. However, n is defined inside the make dot power function. And so since uh, that's the environment in which the power is defined, it will find the value of n. The power function will find the value of n inside uh, its other environment. So what happens is that I can call make dot power and pass it a number like three. And then it will return a function which I will assign to be called cube. And similarly, I can pass two to make that power and create a function that I'll call square. So now when I, when I pass cube, the number three, what it does is it raises three to the third power. So I get 27. If I call square on the number three, it raises three to the second power. So it gives me nine. And so now I've got one function that's capable of constructing many different types of functions by raising to various powers. So how do you know what's in a function's environment? So you can look in the environment in which the function was defined by calling the ls function. So if I call ls on the environment for cube, you can see that inside the cube function, there's an object called n. And if I use uh, get on n, you'll see that uh, the value of n is equal to three. So that's how the cube function knows to raise it to the third power because it's already defined in its closure environment. Similarly, the environment for square, you can see it has the exact same objects in it. But now the value of n is equal to 2 in the square function. Now I want to make one brief comparison between lexical scoping, which is what R does and dynamic scoping, which is what maybe some other programming languages implement. So here I'm assigning the value of y equal to 10. Then I create a function f, which takes as an argument x. And then there it assigns uh, y equal to 2. It squares y and then adds g of x. So what's g of x? Well, g is another function which takes as an argument called x. And it multiplies x times y. So in the f function, y is a free variable and g is also a free variable. So the g function is not defined inside of f. Then in the g function, the symbol y is a free variable. And so the question is, if I call f of three, what gets returned? So with lexical scoping, the value of y and the function g is looked up in the environment in which the function was defined, which in this case was the global environment. So that the value of y in the g function is 10. So with dynamic scoping, the value of y is looked up in the environment from which the function was called. 
sometimes called the calling environment. So in the R, the calling environment is known as what's called the parent frame. In this case, the calling environment Y was defined to be 2 and so the value of Y would be 2. So calling the function F would produce different answers depending on whether you use lexical scoping or dynamic scoping. So the one thing that will make lexical scoping and the dynamic scoping look the same is that when a function is defined in the global environment and is subsequently called from the global environment. Then the defining environment and the calling environment are ex exactly the same. And so this can sometimes give the appearance of dynamic scoping even when it doesn't exist. So here I have got a function called g. It takes an argument x. It assigns a to be equal to 3 and then it adds x plus a plus y. So in this case x is the formal argument of the function while a is a local variable so it's not a formal argument but I defined it inside the function and then y is a free variable okay. So if I call g of 2 the function g is going to look for the value of y in the global environment. If I haven't yet defined y then there has to be an error because it doesn't know what value to assign to the symbol of y. So that's what I get in this line here. Now if I define what y is, say I assign it to be 3, if I call now uh, g of 2, because now it's able to find y in the global environment. So even though it looks like the value of y was looked up in the calling environment, it's actually the defining environment because g happened to be defined in the global environment. So there are a number of other languages that support lexical scoping. Some examples are like Scheme, Perl, Python and Common Lisp. And of course, uh, there's a well-known computer science theorem, which is that uh, all languages eventually converge to Lisp. And so it's not an obscure type of feature. It's uh, actually very common in a number of other programming languages too. So one of the main consequences of lexical scoping in R is that uh, all the objects have to be stored in memory. So if you are working with a programming language that has very small objects, generally speaking, this is not a big problem. But because of nature of the scoping rules and uh, because of the complexity of the environment and the way they are all linked together, it's difficult to implement this type of model outside of physical memory. And so the consequence was that when R was originally designed, everything was stored in memory. Things are getting complicated now because of very large types of data sets and being able to read them into R is a challenge. Everything has to be stored in memory. Second now, so every function has a carrier pointed to its defining environment and that defining environment could literally be anywhere because uh, there could be functions within functions and then. And if one function returns another function, then there has to be a pointer to that piece of memory where the defining environment is stored. And so this makes the model a little bit more complex, but all the more useful. So in S+, which was kind of the original implementation of the S language, the free variables were lo always looked up in the workspace. Everything could be stored on the disk because the defining environment of all the functions was the same. That's it for today. See you in the next lecture.